to learn about how the weather is forecasted. Uh, we have with us today Colleen, Colleen Hussein. He's a bit of a household name, being the founder and managing director of the Trinidad and Tobago Weather Center and also the weather anchor at CNC Three News. He attended Naprima College and is a graduate of the British International School of Houston with an international diploma of Texas A&M University with his PSC in Geophysics and Seismology. He is an avid environmentalist and geoscientist with an active membership in the EAPG and several other geological organizations. Through his platforms at the TT Weather Center and CNC3 News, he tries to constantly engage and educate the public on ongoing geophysical events occurring ac across Trinidad and Tobago, the Caribbean region and beyond. I'd like to welcome Colleen. If you uh, want to, to start. Uh, I think I'm up now. All right. Hello, everybody. Hi, Colleen. <laughs> All right. So I'm Colleen. Uh, I keep things pretty informal, even these talks. So if you have any questions as I go along the way, just shoot them in the chats and I will try to respond to them. Um, so yeah. Um, going to talk about how we forecast the weather. And not just me, but generally meteorologists around the world. Even though I'm not a degreed meteorologist, I did take all the classes and fulfill all the educational requirements to be classified as one. So I'm going to take you through basically everything I do from the start of my day to the end of the day, trying to figure out what I tell you everyone at 7 p.m. when it's time for me to give you the weather forecast. So I'm going to share my screen and we're just going to be going through a whole bunch of different websites. And something I want to add that all of the data and all of the information I'm about to show you, nearly all but one of them are freely available to everyone. So you can go and fact check your meteorologists if you really want to. But do remember that meteorology, meteorologists at the Met Office, the National Hurricane Center and any meteorological service around the world, they do have the expertise. Um, of their Met offices, their, the, the amount of literature at their disposal to definitely have more knowledge than the average Joe when looking at raw data. So we're going to start with what I look at as soon as I open my computer, would be the observations at the Piaco International Airport as well as the Crown Point International Airport. Now, both of these airports are what um, we consider climate monitoring sites for Trinidad and Tobago. And on the hour, every hour, um, the Met Office in located at Piaco and Crown Point will give an observation of what the weather is like at their location. And that encompasses the temperature, humidity, the wind speeds, what weather is actually occurring, the pressure, all that fun stuff. And if there is, uh, let's say, a thunderstorm or something happening nearby. You will see special reports issued irregularly anytime, any time of day. And you will see like wind gusts of 46 kilometers per hour. And this happened yesterday afternoon just during a thunderstorm. So these are the things that I would look at. And the first thing I always like to do is look at what's happening on the ground. Um, so that's observational data. And that's what most meteorologists do. They try to see what's going on outside before we start looking at all the observation, all the uh, model data and that stuff. So the first things I do, we look at what's going on in Piaco, look at what's going on in Crown Point. Now, if you want to look at whether that's going on around the world, the National Weather Service has this lovely website where you can look at data from all, all the what's around our region. So obviously my area of interest will be the Southern Windwards. And that includes Trinidad, Tobago, Grenada, Barbados, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and anything that's east of us. And I'll get to what's east of us in a little bit. And this gives you also uh, the ability to click on any one of these, and you can check out what is going on at any of these reporting stations. And what this gives you is an overall picture of any weather that's going on in our area, as well as what's approaching. So this one is reporting a 16 knot. Uh, wind gusts from the east, as you can see that wind bob. So that's what I look at first. And then if there's ever a, an issue that, let's say we have a tropical storm coming, which we actually do, or any inclement weather, I also go to the Met Office's website to figure out if we have any alerts in effect. Now, 
Trinidad and Tobago Meteorological Service is the official meteorological uh, reporting agency for Trinidad and Tobago through the government, and they are the ones that would the only source where you should be getting any warnings or watches or alerts issued for Trinidad, Tobago, and Grenada and its dependencies. So anytime there's an adverse weather alert or a flood, a riverine flood warning, or even a tropical storm warning, this is the link you want to go to. Sorry, there will be the Met Office's early warning website. And right now there are no alerts because right now there are no um, impending weather systems that will bring us inclement weather at least through the next I would say 48 hours to 72 hours, but after that time frame, we have a lot more coming. So that's the things I look at first, and then when it's time to actually figure out what's going on in the atmosphere, whether we're going to get rain or thunderstorms, this is a very complex graphic. It's called a skew-t diagram. And this uh, essentially is a profile of the atmosphere. And it's recorded by a helium balloon with an instrument at the bottom that travels through the atmosphere all the way up to the top of it, bursts, and then that instrument sometimes make it back down to the ground where it can be recovered by people or it lands out at sea. And these balloons in Trinidad and Tobago are launched every 12 hours at 8 a.m., at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. And we usually get the data between 8 and 9 a.m. and 8 and 9 p.m. And like I said, it gives you a snapshot of the atmosphere so we can figure out what's going on above because the atmosphere is like a layered cake. Similar to below our ground, it's a layered cake there. And the way that that cake sort of interacts above us would determine what kind of weather we see. So just looking at this really complex graphic here right now, so the green line represents the dew point or what is the moisture. That blue line represent, represents the temperature um, curve as it decreases in height, what it should look like. And then the red line uh, shows the actual temperature. And based on the differences of wind, humidity, which is moisture, and temperature, we can really get a good idea of what's going on in the atmosphere and can tell you whether it's going to rain or whether there might be severe thunderstorms or even a thunderstorm, um, if it's even possible, these diagrams are really used for severe weather purposes too, because given the atmospheric profile, it can tell you whether we're going to have a funnel cloud or a tornado and that kind of thing. And all of these numbers that you see to the right-hand side of this graphic, it's really all of the different indices that's calculated using the parameters from this graphic. So some of the parameters I look that always stands out to me would be the cap. Now the cap is basically something that always busts a forecast. So sometimes we get it wrong and I always own up to when I get it wrong because I want to know what I did wrong and fix it to be better in the future and actually get it right the next time. Now the cap is basically an area of stable air above um, an area of unstable air and typically for showers and thunderstorms to form you need an area, you need unstable air all the way through, but that cap, and you can see a cap actually right here, and right here, it's where the temperature is warmer than it's supposed to be compared to the layer of air below it. But right now, that cap is at 1.4 degrees Celsius, and what that value means is that it's an unstable atmosphere. Once we see that value go above 2, then there's more heat that is required for convection or showers and thunderstorms to develop. And that's the number I always look at. Another thing to look at too would be the CAPE and the Convective Inhibition um, Index. Basically, th this number tells you how much, the CAPE tells you how much energy is in the atmosphere and the CINH tells you how difficult it will be for convection to occur. And there's a whole bunch of other indices that sometimes gives you conflicting information. So I'll just go on the text real quick. And it's just, this is all the parameters that I would be looking at um, to give me a clearer understanding. So we see like under the RH, which is relative humidity or moisture, see that it's really moist at the surface. And then as you get to the 700-ish millibar level, it drops off a bit and that's dry mid-level air. And 
Matt Dry mid-level air is something that has been present across the Atlantic since the beginning of the wet season. That's why all of our tropical waves have been quote-unquote dry. That's why any tropical systems that develop really struggle. And the exception to that right now is Gonzalo, but Gonzalo has a few things up its sleeve. And I'll get to that in a little bit. But the indices I was telling you, that's these things here. And the different numbers and the different calculations, it's all based on partial differential equations and lots of complex math. It spits out a number that basically categorizes the atmosphere into different indices, and that can tell you the chances of thunderstorms, showers, or even severe thunderstorms. So if you look at some of them right now, some of them say the risk for showers is probable, none, severe thunderstorms, a chance of thunderstorms. So you really have to know how to use these indices based on the um, atmospheric profile to really come up with a coherent forecast. And that's where the expertise of meteorologists and actually doing the science behind it comes in. Um, so you know how to use these indices well and not just go with the worst case scenario of scattered severe thunderstorms when realistically today we might only see one or two thunderstorms in localized areas across western Trinidad because that's normal for the wet season. So that this one is this skew T diagram. That's the big thing that I use for really when we have severe weather in our area to give me a complete atmospheric profile. But how can I tell if there's severe weather approaching? And for that, we use a hell of a lot of observations. So this is produced by the National Hurricane Center Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch. It's called a Unified Surface Analysis, right? And this Unified Surface Analysis encompasses all the observations at the airports that I showed you earlier, and all the ship observations, other land observations, and it tries to map all of that onto one map of the Atlantic Basin and the Eastern Pacific, and it gives us an idea of where tropical waves are located, where tropical systems are located, high pressure systems, cold fronts, warm fronts, the whole shebang. So this I use as well to track tropical waves. And on Trinidad and Tobago Weather Center, I try to keep a number of how many tropical waves are moving across our area based on this graphic as well as my own analyses using a bunch of other data. And I believe, if I'm correct, this one here is the 25th tropical wave to move across our island. And this tropical wave here, um, just east of us, is the 26th. And that tropical wave was responsible for spawning no tropical storm Gonzalo, but on this graphic it shows tropical depression 7. And we have another tropical wave just moved off the African coast, and that's forecast to move across us later next week. So this surface analysis gives me the idea, uh, well, shows me exactly where high pressures are located, where tropical waves are analyzed, and these graphics are put out every day at the, we, meteorology, meteorologists generally use Zulu time, which is um, Greenwich Meridian time. Um, so we see 0Z, 6Z, 12Z, 18Z, and that just um, correlates to 8 p.m., 2 p.m., 8 a.m., Something like that. Yes, 8 a.m., 8 p.m., 2 a.m., 2 p.m. That's it. That's the times. So we see those graphics come out about two hours after that. So this one that we're looking at right now is the 12Z. So that's the 8 a.m. surface analysis. And it was made on uh, 14Z, which is 10 a.m. So we get it a little bit delayed, but it, it's a really useful graphic to give us an idea of what atmospheric features are across the Atlantic, what's affecting us, what's north of us, that kind of thing. And something that's missing from this graphic across our area is the intertropical convergence zone. And you sort of see that right here as that dashed line. So the intertropical convergence zone is actually just south of Trinidad right now. And it meets where uh, now tropical storm Gonzalo is and then merges with something called the monsoonal trough, which is across Africa. And is really far extended into the Atlantic right now, which is not unusual, but it is kind of uncommon for this time of year. So beyond using the National Hurricane Center surface analysis, I also like to see what other products are out there. Because in meteorology and most science-based fields, a lot more data is always better to get a consensus versus relying on one product that could be wrong. So the Barbados Meteorological Service also produces um, surface analysis and different analyses at different levels of the atmosphere. And remember I said, that 
based on how these different levels of the atmosphere interact with each other, that's how we get the weather that we experience. So this is the Barbados meteorological surface analysis for the same time, 12Z, and you can see that there is a notable difference. We have a, a tropical wave here, a tropical wave well north of Trinidad and Tobago. We have where the tropical depression 7 was this morning, now tropical storm Gonzalo. And then we have another tropical wave east of us. And you can see that they were in different positions to what the National Hurricane Center says. And it all boils down to the meteorologist that looks at all of these observations. And this is their perspective on what's going on in the atmosphere across the Atlantic. And my perspective would be different from another meteorologist's perspective. And it might differ from the, Atlantic, the National Hurricane Center's perspective. So it's all based on a bunch of different perspectives coming to a consensus on what is the most likely scenario you will experience tonight, tomorrow, and going forward. And these analyses also extend well up into the atmosphere. So the three main layers that we really look at, or I should say four, would be the surface, um, the 850 millibar, and pressure, we use these standard pressure, um, these standard pressures to characterize a certain area of the atmosphere that is supposed to respond or supposed to exist in a certain nature. So at the 850 millibar level is what we consider the low levels of the atmosphere. And across Trinidad and Tobago, we generally get winds from the east. So when we see kinks in that wind flow, we know that there's something up. It could be a trough system, a low-level trough, it could be a tropical wave, um, and you see these seas written here, and that's a cyclonic nature, so you're going to see spin, and that's usually indicative of a tropical wave, and an anti-cyclonic, um, so seen by the A, and that's usually a small high-pressure system, and you see those larger A's north of us where that subtropical high-pressure system usually exists. So using these, we can see where there are troughs, the wind flow, um, where and these troughs, typically areas of low pressure, bring unsettled weather, while high pressure systems bring settled weather. So at the low levels, we're really looking for troughs, that, and that really affects Trinidad and Tobago and bring heavy rainfall, and those troughs could also include tropical waves. Now, the other layer we look at is the 700 millibar layer, and that layer is also considered the low level just on the boundary between the low level and mid levels of the atmosphere. And this is where we see tropical waves really show up more pronounced than any other layer um, beyond the surface, that is. And you can see now tropical storm Gonzalo here and a bunch of other anticyclonic, which is high pressure systems, and cyclonic, which are low pressure systems. And we continue high up into the atmosphere now at the 500 millibar level. And then the highest level, which is considered the upper level of the atmosphere, which is 200 millibars. So these are all the different surface analyses that I would look at to determine what's happening now and what's going to happen in the future, what's moving our direction. Now, the prettier version of this would be satellite imagery, right? So satellites, like technology, really has advanced over the last decade. And even if you look at times prior to that, so we're going back like 30 years, we never had this amount of detail and the amount of, um, I should say, frequency of data that comes in now. This that you're looking at right now is the GOES East or GOES 16 satellite that gives us an update as frequent as every minute. And you can see Tropical Storm Gonzalo just east of Trinidad and Tobago. And you can get updates on that every minute. Generally, the view that I am looking at, get updates every 10 minutes. And looking at this, you can tell so much, especially visible satellite imagery. So just to point out a few features here, you can barely see a tropical wave that's moving across here. And on satellite, visible satellite imagery, to find a tropical wave, you look for an inverted V pattern. That, and that's really the kink in trade winds, right? So that's a tropical wave right here. You have Tropical Storm Gonzalo here. You have a lot of Saharan dust that's actually heading our way. Most of it will stay to the north of us. And that Saharan dust really shows up in that sort of dingy, sort of brown tan color. And ahead of that, it's a share line. Or um, this is actually an area of uh, speed trade convergence because we have a lot of strong winds moving behind that this line of clouds. And that Saharan dust is accompanying a surge of trade winds. And where trade winds build up, 
converges and that forces air upwards and that also causes showers and thunderstorms. So that is forecast to move across the Lesser Antilles on Friday through the weekend, but because of Gonzalo being here, that will miss Trinidad and Tobago. So Gonzalo is going to save us from the Saharan dust, but unfortunately bring some severe weather to us this weekend. Now, even looking on satellite imagery, you can pick out the intertropical convergence zone. You can pick out other systems that's developing. So we have another tropical disturbance in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can look at the globe and just see a whole bunch of different things. And the good thing about these newer satellites, and these, sat these satellites can pick up a bunch of different um, data. So generally what you're looking at right now is the visible satellite imagery. If you took a camera up to space, took a picture of the Earth, but a lot of it is really looking at different wavelengths. So the diff based on the different wavelengths, we can see different types of data. So if we look at the 7.3, um, what is that unit? Um, 7.3 micromillimeter, I think that's the correct units, or smaller than that. But if you look at that unit, you can see this one specifically shows us the low level water vapor. So low level water vapor is really what triggers our localized showers and thunderstorms, or I should say fuel. And across Trinidad and Tobago right now, we have some, not abundant, because abundant low-level moisture will look more like these gray clouds where clouds actually exist. But if you look to the north of us, a lot of dry air at the low levels. But remember I said that mid-level water vapor or mid-levels have been pervasively dry across the Atlantic. That's shown by these red and orange colors, and just look how dry the Atlantic is right now. Gonzalo right now is trying to fight off all of that dry air as it moves towards us. But the good thing, well, the good thing for the system, bad for us, is that because of its tiny nature, it will be able to fight it off pretty well. Now, this mid-level environment is has been pretty hostile for June and July. So that's why these tropical waves have been passing us with little to no rainfall and has been busting both my and the other meteorologists on other TV stations and the Met Office's forecast sometimes because these the dry mid-level air sometimes exists where it shouldn't be or where it's modeled and it prevents showers and heavy showers I should say from forming and persisting. So that's this is I love using the satellite imagery um, just because of so much you can see and also it's pretty to the eyes. So really nice satellite imagery here but it's also a very powerful tool for weather forecasting. Now moving beyond that satellite imagery can also be satellite data should could also be used to derive information from it. So University of Wisconsin, they have great products put out and they have satellite derived winds and we see this is more to the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere. And this can tell us where we have troughs and high pressure systems uh, at the upper levels of the atmosphere that can in influence weather that we experience. We have upper level winds, we have low level winds and something that you hear frequently about wind shear. Now, wind shear is essentially, you have two different types of shear, directional shear and vertical shear. Directional shear is the difference in speed. Vertical shear would be the difference in direction of winds. And we need low wind shear for showers and thunderstorms to develop, but wind shear is also favorable for severe thunderstorms, particularly in the mid-latitude, so we're really looking across North America. But across Trinidad and Tobago right now, and east of us, we have low wind shear, which theoretically should be able to support showers and thunderstorms. But as you saw in the previous image, it's a lot of dry air at mid-levels, which prevents that. So instead, we have these pop-up showers and thunderstorms during the afternoons across the western areas of Trinidad and Tobago. And that's due to a whole bunch of other things. Uh, we have sea breeze convergence, where winds from the Gulf of Paria meet from the Atlantic and converge. And that's why we have showers and thunderstorms across western Trinidad and the, all the heat from the urbanized areas across our western half of the island really, really allows for that convection to flourish. So wind shear, um, something that's very useful. We can also pull out areas of upper level divergence where winds at the top spread out. So that's favorable for thunderstorms to flourish and persist. And we have low level convergence where that is pretty much the triggering mechanism for showers and thunderstorms to occur. So that's all observational data as well. And then we have another product here from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And this one shows us how much moisture is in the entire atmosphere column. 
So from the ground all the way up to about the 200 millibar levels. I think it even goes up to zero millibar levels, which is the top of the troposphere. And this in conjunction with satellites, visible satellites and different types of satellite data, as well as surface observations. So those observations we will get from ships and um, ground stations at airports and other weather stations help us point out features like tropical waves, like um, troughs, and you can see the spin, especially with Tropical Storm Gonzalo here. We have another uh, air tropical disturbance in the Atlantic with a lot of moisture there. But you can also see this large pocket of dry air that's ahead of Gonzalo and where that speed trade convergence is occurring. So that dry air is really going to limit showers and thunderstorms or what, what you may consider the calm before the storm, before Gonzalo arrives. And it also would bring a bit more Saharan dust, unfortunately, because that dry air tends to coincide in the Atlantic with Saharan dust. But that tropical wave will move across mainly Trinidad and Tobago um, through the end of the week and could help at least Trinidad um, with that air quality issue. But this graphic is also really powerful in helping me determine where tropical waves are and help me determine the forward speed of it all. And we can see the Atlantic really moistening up right after the passage of Gonzalo. And that means bad news for us with the peak of the hurricane season nearing because more moisture means more fuel for these tropical systems to develop and strengthen. So that's all observational data. Now let's talk about modeling. So models um, are essentially run by supercomputers around the world. And typically the big ones that we always talk about would be the European model, which is the EMCWF, the American model, which is the GFS, um, the German model, which is the Access G, and you have the UK MET model, which is not shown here. Um, and there is a ton of different models. So if I clear all of this, you can see all of the different models that are produced. You have the European and the European ensembles, the American, the American ensembles. Um, you have all of these different models at your disposal. But the key thing is knowing how you can use it, knowing their biases, knowing um, really what parameters to select and knowing when to weigh it versus another solution. Because remember, these models show you one possible outcome. It may not be the possible outcome. So instead of relying on one model or one run of a model, which means uh, if all of these models are run at 8 a.m., don't rely on just the 8 a.m. suite of models. Look at the trends. Is it trending wetter? Is it trending drier for rainfall? Is it trending for a tropical, a stronger tropical system or a weaker tropical system? Is it trending for that system to move north, move south, that kind of thing? I try not to rely on an individual model run, but more so a trend. That way, you, you tend to have a better idea of what's going to happen going forward because this is where the models are trending to. So that's the most likely outcome. So, that's just some of the model. And remember I said all of the data is available for free. Well, this is the one that's not available for free because these models are run by supercomputers and these supercomputers are super expensive. The, Euro the European model alone um, would cost a commercial purchaser about 200,000 pounds or euros, I believe. Uh, the GFS is free for most. The UK Met also has a price tag on it. That's the, the English model, the United Kingdom. And then you have all of these others, some available for free, and you can find them all over the internet. And then some of them you do have to pay for. So you'd have to go through a subscription-based platform like weathermodels.com, which is what I use. Now, that's modeling. And we've had a lot of, you'll see actually a lot of discussion going forward, especially over the next few days, as Gonzalo nears Trinidad and Tobago, where people may post up some scary looking models showing a strong hurricane or something near our area. But like I said, don't rely on one model. Look at the trends and try not to look at a doomsday scenario. Try look at information coming from verified sources, such as the Met Office, the National Hurricane Center, especially when it comes to tropical systems, because tropical systems are way more complex than anyone really makes it out to be. So that's that on modeling. That's the second step. So observational data first, modeling right after. And then the next thing I like to do is look at what is everybody else saying. So Trinidad and Tobago, the authority is the Met Service. 
So this is the forecast for today posted on their website. And you can see that today, cloudy spells with showers in the afternoon, heavy showers with thunderstorms in a few area, and night times will be partly cloudy with a few showering spells. So the Met Office pr produces a forecast every, every day, um, three times a day, uh, generally at 6 a.m., 10 a.m., and 4 p.m. And that's available on their website. Sometimes they post it on their social media pages. But something that I don't think a lot of the public actually knows is that whether anchors or whether persons on TV, we actually sometimes, well, I can speak for myself, and I know when I'm looking at these forecast, the amount versus forecast, comparing it to um, other TV weather persons, um, we actually all create our own forecasts that are different from the Met Office. Most of them generally say the same thing. Some of them are more specific. So instead of saying partly cloudy spells will occur in varying localities this afternoon, I would actually say favoring western, southern, and hilly areas of Trinidad and western areas of Tobago. Because in my understanding, that's where most of the showers will actually occur based on my analysis. And remember I said meteorology is all about different perspectives coming together and then that that coherent push towards this is the most likely outcome for that one situation. So that's the most likely outcome based on this meteorologist's perspective of the atmospheric profile as they an analyzed it. And these things change based on meteorologists to meteorologists. Sometimes there's consensus, sometimes there isn't. And a lot of sometimes we have competing forecasts and sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. And we all have to always take it with a grain of salt and learn to be better, figure out where we went wrong and try to fix that. So these forecasts, there's one from the Met Office, Trinidad and Tobago Meteorological Service, I read personally. And then there's also the Bahamas, Meteor sorry, Barbados Meteorological Service. Now they put out a really extensive five-day forecast or five-day discussion, I should say, Obviously aimed at Barbados because that's where they're forecasting for, but it's always good to see what's happening in the neighboring countries, what their meteorolog meteorologists think, what's going on. And I love reading these things because for me, I love data and more information is always better for my forecasts rather than a lack thereof and going in blind. So this is just something that the Barbados Meteorological Service produced. And then going even internationally, we have the Weather Prediction Center puts out a forecast discussion and uh, some forecast for the tropical Atlantic. And they are based in the US and this is the international desk. So they put out stuff for the Caribbean and they have these charts that they produce showing the similar to a surface analysis, but instead it's a forecast surface analysis So what they expect to occur. National Hurricane Center also does this. But I also look at the graphs that they put out, giving me an idea of what precipitation they expect, as well as the whole thick write-up of it. So you will see that on here, where they have a, a lot of text, uh, and it's really technical jargon, so you need to know your meteorological terms and how to decipher this. But this discussion is really aimed at meteorologists, not so much the general public. So you need to have some meteorological knowledge to really decipher what they're saying. So on top of the International Prediction Desk, my last thing that I look at would be the tropical weather discussion from the National Hurricane Center. And that basically goes over the surface analysis that we looked at earlier, this, and gives me a more detailed look and a discussion of what is happening in the Atlantic with tropical waves, and, I'm um, sorry, I have to drink some water there. Tropical waves and what's going on around the Atlantic. So it gives me the speed of what those tropical waves are moving at, uh, what activities associated with them, that kind of thing. So observational data, first thing. Model data is the second thing. And then see what your colleagues are saying. Um, again, all about the comparing different perspectives and which one would be the most likely outcome. So something that I always am super interested in, purely because I am always incredibly affected by even the slightest concentration of Saharan dust in the air, is our air quality forecast. So our air quality right now across Trinidad is still technically good. And this dashboard is 
from the EME and it gives you um, so the air quality for different particulate matters across Trinidad and Tobago. Now the point Bethlehem station and uh, Signal Hill Tobago station right now isn't reporting data but the one at Point Lisa is. So right now it's showing me that air quality is good all around. But when you take a look at what's going on behind the scenes and I can feel my throat getting all itchy and my eyes scratchy when I'm even talking about this, is that Saharan dust has increased over the last couple of hours, especially this morning. So for Saharan dust, we look at particulate matter, which is uh, particles that are 10 microns and 2.5 microns, uh, larger and smaller around there. Um, and that's really associated with Saharan dust. And that's the data I look at when looking at what air quality is even there. So you may see good air quality, but there's still Saharan dust in the air. And Saharan dust at this concentrations will really only affect sensitive groups. But guess which group I fall into? A sensitive group. So even when air quality is good, you still can take a look behind the scenes. And this is publicly available from the EME on their um, air quality dashboard. You can go and find that online too, because it's a good tool to use. And I know in August, they will actually be rolling out an app so everybody can just pull up their phone and look at what the air quality is outside. Now this again is observational data. So time to look at the next step, satellite data. And this is also from that pretty satellite image, uh, satellite imagery from the Goes East that shows all of the oranges um, as Saharan dust. Now the problem with this particular image is that sometimes it picks up these upper level clouds and you see that band here of cloudiness that it's picking up as Saharan dust. But really, you have to look at the concentrations behind it, and it gives you an idea of how much dust is coming our way. Now, this year on the top right hand side is actually upper level clouds. But remember in June, I think it was around Labor Day, um, we had this really severe surge of Saharan dust. Well, all of these reds were actually white. Like it was the worst Saharan dust surge in recorded history, at least for Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and I keep a close eye on this because it gives me an idea of. When, tr when tropical waves move through, we have these surges of Saharan dust moving in. And as we go into August, September, October, Saharan dust finally lifts northward. So we'll get a bit of a breather. So we have the observational data from the EME. We have the satellite imagery from Goes East. Time to look at models. So this is one of the models that I use, the NASA um, Geos Dust Extinction. So it gives me, um, it shows essentially the amount of particulate matter based on the reflectivity in the atmosphere, um, how much dust is going, uh, moving across the Atlantic. So we see that this it initialized this morning, so 22nd of July. We have a surge of dust moving across the um, Atlantic on 24th, which is on Friday. But most of it will be staying north of us, and that's due to Tropical Storm Gonzalo. So all of this dust will be moving across, and we have another surge coming in right after that. That one will actually affect us into next week. And then more dust, more dust. Now, dust surges, like I said, affect us right after the passage of a tropical wave. And then another tropical wave moves along, improves air quality for a bit, and we have a surge right after that. But as we move through the hurricane season, all of this dust moves northward finally. Now, I keep mentioning tropical storm Gonzalo, and that's a pretty big threat for us. So looking at tropical systems, I leave that expertise to the National Hurricane Center because they have people that have been working on research and in this field for decades. And I mean like up to 30 years. So they definitely have all the experience there when it comes to forecasting the intensity and track of these systems. So always defer to them when it comes to the exact track and intensity of the system. But when it comes to local impacts, that's when you revert to your local meteorological offices because they can give you more specific guidance on where what you can expect for your country. So Gonzalo right now is a tropical storm, 50 mile per hour wind, so that's about 85 kilometers per hour sustained winds, well east of Trinidad and Tobago, far, well in the central Atlantic, but it is forecast to become a hurricane tomorrow and then transition into a very strong tropical storm. Now it's gonna be negligible impacts between negligible difference in impacts, I should say, between a borderline category one hurricane and a strong tropical storm. So even though you're gonna see in the headlines Friday night, 
the hurricane is now a tropical storm, do not let your guard down because it's going to be the same impacts. Even though the center is going to pass north of Trend north of Tobago, we're still going to see some gusty winds, heavy rainfall. And for those living in Trinidad and Tobago, you know that it really doesn't take more than a strong gust of winds to blow someone's roof off and a bucket of water to fall for the country to flood. We have such a high flood vulnerability. So taking a closer look at Gonzalo, uh, it is east of Trinidad and Tobago, and it's actually, unfortunately, putting on a burst, uh, a burst of convection that usually precedes rapid intensification. So what that means, it's strengthening, and it's going to strengthen pretty rapidly over the next 48 hours as it tries to beat off that Saharan dust and dry air north of it from that trade wind, that trade wind surge, and then just west of it with that lingering Saharan dust that's currently affecting us now. The good thing for Gonzalo is that it's really small. Right now, the maximum radii of winds is only 37 kilometers, and that's really, really small for a tropical cyclone. So a typical tropical cyclone, we t tend to see that nearing 100 kilometers, and it's a large one for just the diameter of winds. So small changes in track could occur and either move all of the weather north of us and no impacts for us or move it south and we have severe impacts. Could also mean that it's subject to really wild fluctuations in intensity. So this could go from a tropical storm tonight to a hurricane tomorrow back down to a tropical storm and then possibly back up to a hurricane. These small systems uh, very vicious when it comes to strengthening quickly, but it, because of its small size, it can also weaken very quickly. So fingers crossed for not a really strong system, but right now the National Hurricane Center is forecasting a strong tropical storm, borderline category one hurricane, moving just north of Tobago and unfortunately moving directly across Grenada. And that's seen by all of these models that we look at. This is the European this is the American, and this is the track guidance, so it's still taking it north of Tobago, and this is the uh, UK Met, which is the UK. So that is, in a snapshot, how I forecast weather. And it really is a 24-7 job because, you know, the weather changes so um, quickly, and it's... There's so much that changes, and you always have to be ready for that change. So it's a 24-7 job just because I keep always looking at the latest trends, the latest dates that comes in, and I honestly love it. I wouldn't do anything differently. Uh, even though I did geophysics and I had a small stint at BP doing like some uh, interpretation of seismic data and stuff, like love that too, but this is definitely my bread and butter. So that is all for me. I know we wanted to have a little bit of question time at the end. So Thank shoot if you have any questions. Thank you, Colleen. That was really, really interesting. And kudos on being able to cram that much information into sh such a short time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess I'll start. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to either type it in your chat box or turn on your mic and, and you could ask Colleen directly. But um, I guess I, I'll start. Uh, they are forecast every day, sometimes twice a day or, or multiple times a day. How long does it take you to put together one of these interpretations? Or is it like you get quicker, quicker with practice? Or, um, it definitely is for me quicker with practice, but it takes me on average to interpret and writes, I love writing everything down and what you will see in a lot of meteorological offices across the world, they actually will sit down on that surface analysis, they will hand draw that. That's actually a really fun thing for meteorologists to do. I know it sounds nerdy. So doing stuff like that, it will take me about two to three hours to put together a decent forecast. Looking at all the models, looking at all the variations, writing it down, looking at it on a piece of paper and figuring out, okay, this is what's going to happen next. So Something on Trinidad and Tobago weather center I do is when I put out like a tropical update or something, there's also a five day forecast attached to that. So putting together all of that, making all of the graphics and stuff takes me about that three hour mark. Same thing for TV, because I make my own graphics and um, have to put together that. I do three days tonight through next, so you'll get the Saturday forecast from tonight. 
um, that will also take me about that three hour mark. So actually when I'm done here at three, I am going to start doing that for the 7 p.m. news tonight. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, I think it, it was a lot longer than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anybody else have any questions? I just have one question. Um, hi, Colleen. Great talk. Really informative. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I'm just a bit curious as to how you initially got into meteorology from like moving from geophysics. What initially that's a, got you interested? That's a fun question. Geology? So when um, growing up, I always wanted to be a geophysicist because I think when I started watching, like really watching Discovery Channel and National Geographic as a kid, it was during the time where the Indian Ocean tsunami happened um, and everybody on TV that was talking about the natural disasters, they all had the title under their lower third bar saying geophysicist. And I was just like, you know what? 10 years old, this is what I want to be. So up until, I guess, 14, I was on track. This is what I want to do. And I'm still super interested in it. Like Trinidad and Tobago Weather Center does get my nerdy side out with the whole natural hazard side of things. But what I didn't realize was that there was an oil and gas side of things too. And that is where my parents wanted me to go, not the natural hazard side. So that was a bubble being busted right there. Um, so when I, when I was 14, I moved to the US and I realized that there's a literal whole new world outside of rain and sun. You have winter weather, you have severe weather, like thunderstorm, uh, severe thunderstorms releasing hail, funnel clouds, tornadoes, the whole shebang. You have so many different types of winter weather from sleet to uh, uh, flurries to full-fledged blizzards um, and how difficult it is to really forecast those things and even when you do forecast things, really small changes in the atmosphere could bust your forecast. And that's when I got really interested in meteorology. And then when it was time for me to choose a degree, um, I applied to all my universities for meteorology and some of them offered a good geophysics program. And then when I went to university, my parents funded my university and unfortunately they said, we're not going to pay for a meteorology degree because what you're going to do, come back to Trinidad and read the weather news, jokes on them, um, because that's, that's what I wanted to do. So I decided, okay, well, I will do the geophysics and seismology degree. That's what they wanted me to do. I still enjoy it, but I always wanted to do weather. And that's where Trinidad and Tobago Weather Center began. Because in 2014, that's when I started university. That's also when I started Trinidad and Tobago Weather Center. And because of that, I sort of got the great sides of both, I guess, because the university I went to, Texas A&M, has an exceptional meteorology program. They have an exceptional geophysics program. So I was able to go to the meteorology classes and I tried to double major at one point, but it was a lot given that like I was majoring in geophysics and seismology, minoring in math, minoring in geology. So it was difficult for me to keep that meteorology going. So I was like, you know what? It makes sense for me to do the geophysics. It, is a, it makes more sense economically. But because I always wanted to do the weather side of things, I kept Weather Center going. And then when I came back to Trinidad, it was right when uh, the closure of Petrotrin happened. So it was difficult for me to find a job in the industry. And then a couple of months later, I got the call from CNC3, and here I am. Oh, wow. Thanks for that, for that question, Alex. I got a few questions um, messaged to me. I guess some people are being shy. Um, but could you describe uh, your favorite or, the, or I guess in this case, the most intense um, weather phenomenon that you would have covered? Uh, I think I have a video in mind that's um, <laughs> of, of you in the rain, but uh, you can so, you could describe that. Yeah, so the most intense weather experience that I covered would obviously be Tropical Storm Karen. Now, I've only been at CNC3 for a year. Um, August will be a year. So I've only had really Karen to cover um, tropical system-wise. And for me, I hate when... I used to love these systems. Like, when they were coming through, I was so excited, super, like ready to track it and all that stuff. And that's still me now, but with when Weather Sensor blew up, I 
discovered the other side to it, the destruction that comes with flooding and gusty winds and families reaching out to help and you don't know what to do. Karen was one of those because while I was in studio presenting, giving everybody updates, I got word that the around my house started to flood, which never floods. Hello! My producer, his entire house was completely gutted, like he lost everything. Um, so you really get to see the other side, the destruction that comes with these systems, which is why I'm like super anxious about the system that's coming this weekend, Gonzalo, because that has potential to be devastating for Tobago, not lesser so Trinidad. And that's really difficult to see, especially when people are reaching out to you for help and there's not much you can do. Um, but the intense stuff that I've lived through though, Harvey, multiple tornadoes when I lived in Texas, actually the tornado that happened in Trinidad, I think um, end of last year that happened in Woodbrook. I was there on the scene right after seeing the destruction. And again, so difficult to see the destruction, even though with all the excitement going on that we had a tornado in Port of Spain. So Karen was the most intense that I've covered to answer your question. I hope I don't have a repeat this weekend, but given the way that things are looking, there's a chance. Quite the real sunshine, Colleen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my apologies. Uh, I think someone had their mic on by accident there. But does anybody else have any other questions? Let's open up the floor. Okay. All right. If we receive any questions, we'll send them to you, Colleen. But really.